Please welcome on stage Peter Kröner. Okay, thank you. As you've already as you've already heard, my uh, name is Peter. I'm a trainer for web technologies. So, if you want to um, hear more from me, maybe a little bit slower, maybe a little bit more in depth, you can just hire me. The links are on the on the screen. Today we are going to talk about um, progressive web app technologies for content for basically everyday regular web pages and not for fancy web apps. So first we are going to talk about what progressive web apps exactly are. And then we are going to look at approaches how we can use progressive web app technologies for plain old websites. Um, maybe even something for your next project. We are going to look at two ways to integrate them. First, we are going to look at the App Shell model, which provides partial offline support for web pages and fast loadings. And the problem with App Shells is you have to write your web page in a specific way to get this to work. And if that's not for you, you probably want to use an auto generated service worker for performance. This is great because you have to do next to no work and you get basically instantly loading web pages, even with the worst technology for your connection that you can imagine. Because this is only 30 minutes, I'm going to paint in very broad strokes and not go into too many technical details. So if there's some bit of JavaScript where I say this works, trust me, you better just trust me because otherwise we are not going to leave this uh, place anytime soon. Okay, what's a progressive web app? Well, a progressive web app is basically just a fancy marketing term for a proper web app that we would write nowadays. That's all there is. Um, there's certain well keywords attached to progressive web apps, but this is all just very marketing speak and you can't really imagine something when you just look at a cloud like this full of words. So let's look, take a look at a real progressive web app like this one. This is just a little demo app that I wrote. It's mm, basically just a currency calculator. It tells you how much currency A is, is worth in currency B. So this is just a plain old regular web app, just HTML, CSS, and a bit of spaghetti code JavaScript. No, nothing fancy. Well, there is something fancy about this web app. You just can't see it. You navigated to this web app, and in the background, without you noticing or consenting even, um, a little special JavaScript has run that installed something in the background in your browser, a service worker. This, this is just a little JavaScript that I wrote that now lives in your web browser and probably doesn't really go away anytime soon. Sounds creepy, but this is um, the first point where I say, just trust me, this is less creepy than it sounds at first glance. So. Of course, we now have the service worker in this web page and we don't really notice it's there. We can, of course, use today's browser APIs to notify you about the fact that there's a service worker running in the background now. We can um, send you a little notification. This is a native notification like you would get it from your operating system from any regular app. But this, in this case, is triggered from the web page using JavaScript. What does the notification say? Well, it tells you that this web page can now be used when you're offline. This is the, the point of a service worker. It's a JavaScript um, proxy that's running in the background of your web app in your browser permanently, and that can serve content even when this content is not available from the web because it uses an offline cache. So we see this notification and we now know that we can use this web app, we can load this URL, even if we know that we are not online. So we will see this notification and then promptly forget about it, right? Right. Nobody in their right mind would just open the web browser and type in the URL even uh, um, when they know that they are not online, even if they've seen this notification sometime before. So there's a little extra that's installed in this web page. Um, it provides this dialog that basically um, says, hey, you can add this web page to your um, home screen, in this case on the phone, but this could just as well go into the start menu on your Windows machine. Now, we can all do this. We know that we can add web pages to our home screens, and then we have an, an icon on our home screen, and this is all nice and good. But again, nobody usually wants this, because why would you? You can just um, open the web browser and type in the URL, but it gets more um, reasonable to have this icon there if we have offline support. And it gets even better than this. Because if we now click on this icon or tap the icon, 
The web page opens, of course, in the browser that we used to add the icon there in the first place. But in this case, the browser knows that it's not being used as a browser in, ge in the general sense, that we can use it to surf to every other web page, but the browser knows that it's being started specifically for this web app. So the browser opens, shows us the web page, and it hides all of its own UI. There's no browser UI anywhere here. This is still Chrome on Android, but we don't see anything about Chrome on Android anymore. This is just a web page. This is just HTML and CSS and JavaScript, but it started as a regular web page, had a service worker, had this dialog, created an icon, and suddenly this basically feels like a native app. It's not. It's not remotely like a native app, but it basically works like one. So, this is what a progressive web app usually is. It's just a mm, reasonable modern web app that's secure, that's, that's responsive, and that's, that has been augmented using some um, modern web standards to mutate over time from a ba plain web page into a basic native, quasi-native app that works offline, has a starting icon, and basically is indistinguishable from a native app. So, this is what a progressive web app usually is. Now, I've shown you how this works with Chrome and Android, but this works b with basically every operating system that you can think of. Here's the same application um, on the desktop um, with Linux, with Windows. Looks the same, is responsive in this case because we have a wider screen. There's a sidebar. It's just a responsive web page, but it works and functions and looks and feels like a native app. So, that's the deal. And it's um, not that complicated to get this to work. Now, looks complicated. But this is just when I sh show all of my arrows and little boxes at once, but this is never the case. So let's look at how um, a regular web page transitions to a progressive web app. Let's go. Our progressive web app is, in the essence, just a regular HTML page, and that's the bottom line that's always going to work. So if you um, start thinking now about older browsers, maybe um, you think about mobile Safari or anything like this, and you think, ha, ah, there's no way this is ever going to work with, with my customer base. Yeah, maybe, but what's, what's the problem? Your regular customers that use older browsers just get a plain old HTML page, and this will still work. They won't get all the fancy bells and whist whist whistles and the offline support, but, you know, they haven't missed it until now, so why not keep this baseline working? So we just take a regular HTML page and then add two extra resources to it. This is a little JavaScript file, the service worker that we are going to talk about extensively, and something else, the web app manifest. This is just a JSON file that we are not going to talk about at all um, because it's rather boring. It's just a list of resources and meta information about the web page. So our browser now loads th this HTML, HTML page, displays our web app or, or our web page, and everything is just fine. But we've added the service worker to this web page, and what, what this service worker does is it basically creates a little extra JavaScript process in the browser. So uh, this little thing here is an extra JavaScript that's running independent of the page, but in some way it's connected to the page. And this connection works um, like follows. As soon as we have a service worker, it works as a proxy um, inside your browser. So every request that the web app um, is sending to the web, hey, load this picture, never gets sent. Never gets sent directly from the browser to the web, but always takes the trip around the service worker. And the service worker is written in JavaScript, and we can program everything we like about this proxy. We can use it to de direct requests to some other destination, maybe to an offline cache. This is how offline support works. Because once the resources that we want to uh, provide in this web app are in the offline cache, and we have programmed a service worker to redirect any requests from the app to the offline cache, we don't, need we don't ever need to talk to the web again. This is how offline support works. And if this wasn't the there, if the, the service worker didn't exist, well, we are back to just plain old HTML and HTTP. So even if it breaks, even if it's not supported, your web app, your product will still work. And then for the second resource, the manifest that I'm not going to talk about as much, this is the point where the browser creates this little icon. And if we tap on the icon, we just use the browser as a runtime for our web app. and the browser UI itself disappears. So as you can see, we create a basically a standalone HTML and JavaScript and CSS app and just 
over take over whatever browser we find on the target system. It's like Electron, but you don't need to bring your own runtime. You just you know use whatever JavaScript runtime you find on the target system. This works, in theory at least, in every browser, and even in browsers where this doesn't really have support, it still works as a plain old web app. So this is, in broad strokes, how progressive web apps work. So just to summarize this again, we have the browser with our app in there. The app talks to the server. Unless we add a service worker, the service worker then works as a proxy, and every request is tunneled through this service worker. So the web app can at all times just submit a request to the server. Get me this cat picture. And then the service worker is where we decide how this request is handled. So we can, could, for example, say, OK, you want a cat picture, you get a cat, cat picture. The service worker just takes the request, forwards it to the server, we get a cat picture, give it to the app, and it works like um, before. But we could also use the service worker to have some fun with the request. For example, hey, cat pictures, not on my watch, you get a dog instead. I mean, there's not really a reason to do this, but you could if you wanted to. But of course, the more reasonable approach would be to serve images or any other resource, not from the web, but instead from some kind of offline data store, where you don't even have to leave your browser. This is how the offline support works. OK, I think we got this. So, in summary, a progressive web app is just a modern web app with quasi-native quasi, quasi -native features that we add using modern web standards. We can build a progressive web apps to take advantage of the native cap capabilities on any device and combine them with the advantages that web apps have. Web apps have. Write it once and it runs, well, almost anywhere. You just have to put in much more work than with a native app. How does it work? We've seen this as well. We just write a bit little bit of JavaScript that we are going to get into and we write the manifest, the JSON file with the meta information that we are not going to go into. Now. This, until now, was all about writing crazy, fancy web apps. And I assume that many of you just create plain old regular web pages. And that's totally, uh, totally fine. I do this as well. My own web page is just a boring old CMS uh, in PHP. And I still get use of the service worker, and you can too. This is what we are now really going to talk about. We've seen how it works. Now the question is, how can we make it work for us? Now, there's two options to go about this. Um, there's one that's probably not as useful, and there's one that's very useful. So let's talk about the not as useful option first. This is the app shell model. An app shell um, works like this. You have a page. Let's say you work for a newspaper, and your mobile web view looks like this. If we take a look at this, we can see that there's two areas of web page, really. One that changes all the time, this is the content, and one that's always the same. And we can think of the part that stays always the same as a kind of shell that contains the content that's always different. We cannot really cache the always different content in any meaningful way, because the whole point of this newspaper website is to have not um, outdated content. So this is not really something that we can do anything about if the connection fails, but we can cache all the rest. We can keep the app shell in the browser at all times, so it has never to be loaded, never causes any latency, never eats into your data budget. We just need to have some kind of architecture where we can separate the always different part from the always the same part. In the simplest way, this could just be an iframe that contains the always different part. In the not so simple way, you would write an, a complicated single page application for your front end with maybe Neos as a headless CMS in the background or something. So this is one way to go about it. Let's cache the um, application shell. Let's cache the part that stays always the same. We need a service worker, and now, unfortunately, we have to write some JavaScript. Sorry, no way, ab no way around it. OK, let's load the service worker as the last thing that ever happens on our web page. Let's hook into the load event. Why? Because it's way more important that your content is visible and um, can be interacted with as soon as possible. And adding offline support and stuff, that's not as important. So whatever you do with your service worker, do it once everything else is done. OK, then there's the load event. What do we do in the load event? We put in a little extra work. 
for the older browsers out there because there's stuff like Internet Explorer and Mobile Safari and stuff that's not really that good with all the, th the service worker business. So whatever code we run, we run inside this if block so we make sure that none of the users of older browsers even notice that anything is going on that they don't have. Add this if statement and then um, nothing will break. Then we register the service worker. Navigator service worker register worker.js. Worker.js references the worker file, the JavaScript that actually contains the logic for your client side proxy. And this um, command basically tells the browser to download this file, spin up the extra JavaScript thread, and run the code inside there. Now, you would probably assume that this takes a bunch of time because you have to do the request, you have to start up the process. You are right. Um, and you would usually ex um, expect that this here now makes a callback necessary so that we can um, say, okay, once this is done, do the next step because this is JavaScript and everything needs a callback. But unfortunately, it does not because um, it's 2019 and we have async functions. If you don't know anything about async functions, um, just ig ignore basically async await. They just make the code run the way you would expect it to run. You don't have to write any more callbacks. Just trust me on this. This works. This console log statement, service worker ready, will only appear once the service worker really is ready, has been loaded, has been installed, is running. Okay, then um, we just wrap this into try catch, do a little error handling, and then we are good. We have a service worker. Now, what does the service worker do? Uh, well, that depends on what we um, program it to do. Worker.js is just plain JavaScript, and we can write almost whatever we want in there, and we can make it behave how we need it to. So, let's do um, a basic pre-cache operation. Let's just provide offline support for the application shell. Let's create a list of resources to cache. Resources in this case means path, means URLs. This is not files on your server. Remember, this is JavaScript that runs in the browser. But this basically is a list of resources that need to be requested and put into the offline store when the service worker is first installed. So what do we need for the app shell? We need the index path, the whole web page around everything else that contains in my little um, demo case the iframe. We probably need some style sheets, probably need some scripts, maybe a fallback page for when we cannot serve any content because we are really offline. And then this is our list of resources that we want to cache. Our application probably has a name. Our cache has probably has a version. So we just create a name for our offline cache and then, then use these two bits of information to create an offline cache that contains all the resources listed above. OK, let's do this. Let's write a function that handles the, ins the, the installation. Remember, async await just makes sure that the code works like intended and you don't have to write a thousand functions nested into each other. Makes everything much easier. So what do we do when we perform an installation of this, this web application? Well, we open the cache, open the cache with the name that we specified up there. This creates the cache if it's not already existing, and if it's existing, opens the cache for another operation. And what would this another operation be? Well, we just add all the resources to the cache. And we're done. This is just performing the installation. Sorry, this is a modern uh, web API. This is modern web standards. This is not the, I don't know, um, old style AJAX um, HTML, XML, HTTP request stuff. This is actually usable without any crazy framework. So this is our logic for our installation. How do we trigger the installation? No problem at all. There's an event that fires in the service worker called install when the service worker is first installed or when it's updating. And when the install event is happening, we want to um, basically trigger this handle installation function. The handle installation function returns a promise, which is an object um, basically describing the time it takes until this operation has, has finished and this object needs to go into the method wait until on the event obje object. Trust me with this, if you don't do this, there's no guarantee that your handle installation function will actually um, run to completion for a bunch of reasons. I'm glossing over a lot here, but this code, if, we, if you just take a look at it like it's there, does exactly what you would expect it to do. Okay, that's quick, but that's everything there is to do. This is literally the code that's powering this example website. Now, to um, make this again a little bit more clear for everybody who's uh, allergic to JavaScript, our browser loads our, loads our web app, um, just creates a request, creates a, gets a response. This response 
contains the service worker. We spin up the extra JavaScript thread. The extra JavaScript thread has an installation handler. This installation handler tells the service worker to load some resources from the web. Service worker gets the responses, puts the responses into the cache. So this is really the whole process. Well, it's the whole process for part one. Part one meaning doing the installation bit. But there's also the quest question of getting the files back out of the cache. And this is the second step that we are going to do now. Because at the moment, with just the install handler, the service worker still works like this. There's a request, give me this web page, and if it's available, then we get it from the web. If it's not available, we get a 404. And we are going to replace this simple process by something of our own design. Because this is how it usually works, but we can change this. So, for example, if there's a request, let's first look into our cache. And if we have a resource there, serve it from the cache. Don't even go to the web, because why would we? If it's not in the web, uh, in the cache, we can try to get it from the web. And if this works, okay, great. This is our current news. Wonderful. But what if it's not available offline? Well, we don't want to get an ugly, uh, you don't have any connection message. Maybe if it's an HTML page that we cannot load from the web, maybe we can serve a fallback page. That's a proper 404 page. Even if it's not technically 404 because we can't even reach the server, but just something that tells the browser in the web page, hey, you are offline, maybe try again later. This is the, w the flow that we really want. We only want to get to the 404, to the resource not found case, if there's really no other option. And of course, we can design this in any other way. This is just JavaScript. We can program as many exceptions into our service worker as we need to. So let's serve resources from the cache if they are available in the cache. How hard can it be? Well, there's an event in the service worker called fetch. This event fires whenever there's a resource being requested from the web app. And this uh, fetch um, event object has a method called respond with. This rhymes with the install handler where we had to wait until. What do we put into respond with? You guessed it, a promise for um, a response. Where do we get the response from? From a function that handles a request, obviously. So in this function, we try to find the request that's in this, in this fetch event in our cache. We just match in the cache for this URL. If there's a resource, OK, fine. We can return this resource from the cache. And if it's not, we can just fetch this resource from the web because it's not in the cache. This is literally it. I mean, of course, there's a bit more because as I said, we want to create a fallback version. If there's a web page we are trying to fetch, a news page we are trying to fetch, and this news page is not available, we want to serve a fallback. Well, how do we serve a fallback? We try to fetch the response from the web, and if this doesn't work and the response URL ends with HTML, we respond with our offline page. And if this um, response object didn't end with HTML, if it was a request for an image or something, then we fall back to a real 404 message. So, as you can see, you just write exceptions for your routing in your service worker until it's in the state you want it to have, and then you stop and you're done. It's really, you know, you have to know this JavaScript, you have to know all the edge cases, and there are many, but in principle, it's really simple. You just write a simple client side proxy. So, and this now totally works, at least it did 20 minutes ago. Let's see if it still does. So, this is the demo page. And well, this is not really spectacular, it's just um, my fake news website. So how can I really um, make sure that this works offline? Well, at least in Chrome, there's DevTools for simulating bad networks. Um, so we can maybe go fast 3G, slow 3G, and then the web page is slowed down accordingly. I think this is not really that realistic. I mean, fast 3G and slow 3G, I think there's even... Um, Offline, yeah, I mean, offline is probably something that you can r run into in this country. But let's try something that's really slow. <laughs> and just see how this web page loads on a train in Germany. Or rather, this is not scripted at all, but let's go to some other web page. I don't want to um, make fun of this web page because it's awesome. But still, just to uh, if, you, if, if you are a car person, not a train person, let's see if you can get a feeling how yeah, well, how I felt on the trip down here to Dresden. Yeah, this takes ages. I mean, obviously, there's images and stuff that 
I don't have that many of, but still it took some time even to get this basic menu loaded. Now, let's try the same with my generic news. Again, there's some images in here, but let's just, uh, the, the browser cache is disabled, we are on a train in Germany, and then we reload this, and you see the news content takes some time to load, the images take some time to load, but the application shell is there instantly, the top bar is there instantly, and that's because it's not surfed from the web, it's coming directly from my browser. And this is not the volatile browser cache that you are used to, where you have to write some HTTP headers and sacrifice a Go to make it work. This is just the, browser the service worker cache, and it serves what you've written it to serve. So, this loads instantly. I mean, the content is al uh, always takes some time, because this is what we are serving live from the web, but the rest is um, there instantly. Now, this looks great and stuff, but how do you actually separate in your front end your content from your application shell? Well, I, because this is a cheap demo, just use an iframe. I don't think this is really a reasonable option for any serious application. Um, so this is great, it loads quickly, provides partial offline support, um, looks nice, and you can do talks about how you use service workers. But there's also um, a downside to this. And this downside is that you have to have a specific front-end architecture, um, a single page application or use iframes or something similar for this to work. And I don't know if this is really an option for everybody in this room. Probably not. So, is there some s something else that we can do? Can we make the service worker do something for us, maybe without restructuring our whole uh, front-end? Well, of course there is. Let's add some pre-caching just for performance. So, as we've already seen, there's the service worker cache that we can program precisely, only limited through our JavaScript skills, and there's the browser cache where we, you know, have to write HTTP headers, it's very volatile, and it can only cache stuff that the user has already seen. If there's some page somewhere down in the third, in the third level of your um, navigation and the user's never seen it, it's not going to be cached until the user has seen it. Not a problem with the service worker. So. Let's try to use the service worker to get um, all of the disadvantages of the browser cache resolved for us and use my web page, as I said, just a boring PHP powered CMS web page. And let's see what service worker have I written to power my web page. And this is a trick question because I don't have written uh, anything for this web page. I didn't write a single line of JavaScript. I just used a tool that auto generated the service worker that serves all of the content for my web page uh, and I didn't do anything for it. So, this is the workflow we want to have no now. Let's try to cache all of our static resources, images, style sheets, scripts, and the like, and serve that from the cache, fall back to the web page if this is not available, and everything that's not a static resource, not script, style, or image, can come from the um, web in any case, and we don't want to do any work. This is the important bit. Don't do anything for this. Well, that's easy, because there's Workbox. Workbox is um, a toolbox, basically, um, with a bunch of runtime functions uh, for service worker programming and also a CLI. And you can use the CLI to just generate service workers without having to write a single line of JavaScript. You just say, hey service worker, my resources are in this folder over there. Uh, do something, cache it. Don't bother me with it. And it will do just that. So, you just write a config file. This config file contains um, just a bunch of directories. Hey, my scripts are here, my fonts are there, there's my images, and then the service worker is just going to be generated to the service worker file that you specify in this configuration. And then there's some more stuff that you can configure that we didn't even talk about, but you don't even have to care about this. I think you should let these options stay at false, but you can change them if you know what, what this does. If you don't, keep it like this. And this is everything you have to do. Point the service worker to your directories. Integrate this into your build service and into your build script and then you're done. Because then you just install the workbox CLI and run this command workbox generate SW and then this will just generate a service worker and you are done. I'm sorry I can't show you anything because this is literally all there is. Now I could just demonstrate that my web page now also loads really quickly on a train. Um, this is the build script I use for my uh, for my personal page, where you see there's just this command, 
generate SW, and the rest is just compressing images, um, copying some files. But this is all I do to get my service worker running. And this is all that you really have to do in your modern web page today. But I think this is something that you should do. No matter your project, maybe you cannot create an app shell and um, create a fancy single page application. But I think, I mean, I mean, your developers, I think you can do this. This is a quick win for nothing. You don't have to write any JavaScript, don't have to write anything, just install this tool, write a configuration file, and you're done with it, and your web page loads instantly. So, this is a, um, a compatibility table, um, which browser, browser supports which comp um, technology. Not really all that important, because as I've shown you, if it doesn't work, well, it's still a plain regular web page, and it still works. If it doesn't work offline in Internet Explorer, who cares? Didn't work offline before in Internet Explorer, right? So, you can make this better for everyone who is not using Internet Explorer by doing exactly nothing. And I think this is a fine value proposition. So, my final thoughts on this. Um, do it. Do it now. Make your web pages load faster. Yes, um, I spend a lot of time in trains. So, I'm really interested in you doing this. Don't write everything for yourself. Even if you want to write a service worker using JavaScript, don't write it yourself. Use Workbox just as a convenience library. Workbox is basically jQuery for service workers. And you want to use this in any case. And don't remember to test everything. Lighthouse, the um, auditing tool that's integrated into Google Chrome, into the dev tools, can check your web page for PWA best practices. And you'll probably want to do this because why not? Cost nothing, is integrated, cheap, and if you have any more questions, please talk to me. Thank you for your time. Um, 